From October to December 2009, a group of eight teenagers from Connections Kings Lynn worked on a short film exploring the role of women throughout history through the stories of real women from North Norfolk. They visited Kings Lynn Museums, Ancient House, Museum of Thetford Life and Gresson Hall Farm and Workhouse and researched their subject at the local library. Working with filmmaker Alex Murphy, they wrote scripts, filmed, directed actors and presented their own ideas each week. The aim of the project was to provide the group with new skills and experience and a better understanding of their local history. We are Shooting Star Studios. We're a group of teenagers aged 16 to 18 from Connections and we're here to talk to you about women through our ages and how they were treated. Over the past six weeks we have been learning about women throughout history. We have been to Gresson Hall in Deer Room, Kings Inn Museum and the Ancient House in Bedford. We have met different people and we have learned about the way of life in their time period and then we have recorded them and also recorded each other playing different roles from what we learned on the day. The first story we as a group learned about was one of Marjorie Kemp. She was first just an average woman in the town of Kings Lynn, but she quickly became almost like a prophet, as she said that she spoke to God and that she'd heard his words. Well, Marjorie Kemp was a medieval woman in Kings Lynn. Um, she's very religious and she saw visions of God. Really, really religious person. She was also, like, she acts like a bit insane. She went around banging on um, floors, screaming out for him. People doubted her authenticity. So she went to each one of the bishops in many holy places to convince them that she was she truly did hear the voice of God. Hello and welcome to Religion or Rave, the show that finds facts in a load of religious nonsense and separates the skeptics from the saints. Following from last week's lively debate with Mr. Jesus Christ, we have a show all about a more current phase of antics. Please give a big hand for Marjorie Kemp. <laughs> On Team A, we have the Saints who buzz in with this noise. And in Team 2, we have the Skeptics who make this noise. <laughs> Moving on to round 1, we'll watch this clip. Oh Lord Jesus, hear me, I pray for their souls. Pray, pray, I pray for all. She was trying to tell people that she was actually speaking to God in that lot, and her visions may actually be true. She fell into depression after her first childbirth, and since then she became very religious and believed very much in God. Okay, so that concludes round one. Who's winning? We'll find out in round two. And now it's time for round two, the lineup round. Here we have a lineup of different Marjorie Kemp's, but you have to decide who is the real Marjorie Kemp. We have Marjorie Kemp, Marjorie Kemp. I can't believe it's not Marjorie Kemp. I can't believe it's not better. And Marjorie Kemp, the first one looks a bit um, pale. It's got to be a little bit. No, it's got to be Marjorie. Um, I can't believe it's better. Will the real Marjorie Kemp please step forward? holy sites of the known world and I did that in the company obviously of my maidservant and other people who were similarly visiting the holy places so we travelled as quite a large group. What do you actually see in these visions? Are they, are they just blurs? Are they just light? Or is there something that you can actually see? I see a great light and sometimes I see faces and I hear voices 
And now it's time for the deciding round. We have one final challenge to decide who has won, religion or raving. In this round, each team has to make a paper aeroplane, and whichever one flies there is the furthest wins the entire competition. Ready? Oh. Steady? Get making those planes! I think she was just using it to get out of marriage or whatever. Because, like, it all started happening, like, when she didn't want to be with him anymore. So I think it was just a bit convenient that it happened at that time. Um, I think she's quite religious. Um, maybe she did find God in that lot, but it was, we don't really know what was going on inside her head, so we can't really say. <laughs> Mary Smith was a woman in the 1600s. She was accused of being a witch and died on January 1660. Although we know little about her age and her family, we do know that she was abandoned by her husband and had only one son. When she was accused of being a witch, she started to believe it when she said she saw the devil. During the witchcraft trials, a woman was executed here. She was either boiled or burnt, and some people believe that she put a curse that when she was killed, her heart would fly out of her chest and hit the magistrate's window. Legend has it that this actually happened because there was a diamond shape marked with a heart shape in the middle and this is where Mary's heart allegedly hit. I'm going to die. You don't know what it's like to be accused of being a witch. I'm tired. Locked in a cell with no food, no light. No, no sleep. I'm terrified. I don't know what they're going to do to me. I don't know what's going to happen to my son after I'm gone. I don't even know who I am anymore. I never meant any harm, really. But maybe, maybe my accusers are right. Maybe I am a witch. Maybe I am being used by the devil. I'm so, so lonely. Trapped away from my family. The whole world had turned against me. I'm so scared. I don't know what to do. One of the people we learned about was Alice. She was an unmarried mother in the Victorian workhouse. with my boy, who I called George, came here because I had nowhere else to go. It's not too bad in here. George is well looked after. He gets an education, he gets fed. I get to see him for an hour or so every week. We can really sit together and talk about how he's getting on at school. Treatment for me and the other I'm married to others, because I had George when I wasn't married. It's not so good. Um, in this chapel, every Sunday, I sit here with George next to me and listen to Reverend Smith telling me that unmarried mothers are the root of all evil. They're wanton, they're lewd, they're licentious. They lead other people astray. And I listen to all of that with my boy George next to me. So he hears all of that about his mother. I suppose that's the price to pay for having a roof over our heads. The other
women don't much like me. When I'm cleaning in here, doing the sweeping, they move their skirts out of the way because they don't want to be touched by me. Which makes me sad, but I've got the other unmarried mothers to go and talk to and I thank God that they're here. It's why I think I'm getting a bit mad. Some nights when I have a moment to myself, I think, what if I never entered this place? What if I never come in the workhouse? What would my life have turned out like? And then I remember the night when I come in here. It was really cold. I tried to sleep underneath a hedge, but the rain was so heavy, it came through the leaves, and I was just so bitter cold. I was so cold, as cold as I've ever been in my life. And I just thought, Alice, you can't do this, not, not with George, not with George inside me. So I come in, but I honestly think, I'm not sure I'd have survived if I'd stayed outside. No one wanted to give me a job. No one really much talks to you if they know you've got a child and you haven't got a husband. It's it's like you're a you're a touch you're evil and no one wants to be tainted by something like you. So there was no way I could have lived outside. So I come here. I think well at least I survived. At least George has got a chance. When we came here and we learned all about um, what went on, we all thought that it was really shocking and really bad. But the thing is, it's because times have changed so much that um, back then it would have just been normal for them. And like we'd see like things like like the sort of food they'd eat and stuff like that and the sort of work they'd have to do and think that it was quite shocking. But really that's what they'd have anyway, even if they weren't in the workhouse. So like it's just what it was like back then. I believe that the workhouses were a good place because it stopped the poor from dying in the streets or starving to death and I think it also helped the survival of families. I have very strong views of the way people, the women were treated because of them being pregnant without being married. I don't think it's actually really good that they should be singled out and stuff because at the end of the day, they have their own opinions and it's their life, not anybody else's to tell them what to do. And I do think strongly that um, women should be with their children instead of being separated as they are in the workhouse. I do think like the sexism was really unfair, but back then that's just how things were really. So, And things have come on a, lot, a long way since those times. Just because they had a child and the father ran off. That's not their fault. And I think women shouldn't be treated that they're the wrong people because it takes two people to make a child and I don't think that they should have the right to carry on their lives and the women should not. I'd have probably tried to live outside the workhouse but, um, you know, desperate times. You, if you've got a child you'd do anything for it, wouldn't it? Even if that means, you know, put yourself in the workhouse. I don't live in the workhouse but I do live in the hostel and I have to work through my keep and I have to do a lot of stuff for it. Relying on the place I'm living means that I have to do all the stuff they want me to do. It means I don't have freedom. That is exactly the same as I would think of the workhouse. Well, I think that I'm quite privileged in this day and age because back then they were all like separated and all singled out and stuff. And I would have hated for that to have happened to me. This is Millie. She lives in Fetfordshire in the First World War. She used to be a maid, but she just got a new job because all the men were at war. It's 1960. We're at war. We're at war with Germany. Um, and in Thetford, all the young men have uh, marched off to, to France to fight and um, us girls have taken over in the, the borough works. So we're keeping, keeping that open, keeping all our farmers in, uh, in steam engines and uh, it's great. It's kind of scary, some of the work, to work with, uh, with red hot metal, making rivets to hold the engines together. But I love it, it's great. It's so much better than uh, being in service, which is what I was before. 
because um, uh, there you're, you're on duty all the time. You only get one afternoon off a week. At the boroughs, when you leave, that's it. You've got freedom. You can do whatever you like. It's fantastic. It's changed completely. Um, I'm no longer living in someone else's house. I'm living in a boarding house. I can come and go as I please. Um, I can do what I want with my money. Um, the only downside is that uh, my fiance has uh, gone off to war uh, along with all the other young men. So uh, I'm just waiting to see what happens to him. And a lot of the girls here have had, uh, had telegrams saying that uh, their fiancés have, have died. Um, so far, mine's safe. And I just hope that that carries on. Well, I don't think uh, people after the war will ever be able to think of us in the same way because we've always been told we're too feeble to do all these sorts of jobs. But actually, there's nothing to this compared with a day doing, uh, doing laundry. So um, after the war, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to do a lot more jobs than we, uh, we, are, uh, we were before. So I'm looking forward to it. I fancy a bit of a career in, uh, in the industry. Well, they've promised, Lloyd George, good old Lloyd George, has promised that because we're all working so hard um, for the war effort, after the war he's going to give us the vote.